Evening. Again, I'm Kathy Groshen, a clinical social worker here at the CARD Center. I've been here many, many years, so hopefully I'm going to be able to give you some information that's helpful and be able to take your questions. If I go too fast or you need clarification, we're a small group, you're welcome to ask that. I'll try to touch on the counties that you all are um, living in, so if we get something specific, I'll try to add that in. We're going to start off first just about the diagnosis. The first slide. This is an old slide. You can see before May 2013. So there's something that the American Psychiatric Association has for diagnostic codes. Um, and now it's the new one is uh, the five, but right, this is the old slide in the DSM-4. And at that time, we separated out social skills, communication, and these restricted stereotype behaviors. So I just want you to know that this piece is consistent across the diagnosis. So if you have a restricted, like you're restricting uh, food choices or a, a type of sensory or a play, anything restricted or stereotyped, I need a lot of repetition for um, cars or Pokemon or these particular pair of shoes, so just this idea of restricted stereotype behavior, that is really critical in making the diagnosis of autism or an autism spectrum disorder. Social skills communication is critical too. Most people recognize a communication problem in their child first and recognize some social skill issues also. So just to let you know, this still has stayed part of the diagnosis, but it's more combined, just to, for simplification. Because it's really hard for initiating language, receiving language, um, processing language, and have, using your speech, and to separate that out in all social situations. So socially, we're, we want communication to be an intention and responded to, and we, have, we need human interaction for that. And we need to take somebody else's perspective. So that is critical for social skills. So it, this has really gotten combined so that it looks like this now. The autism spectrum disorder. It's a little confusing now because I'm just I'm going to go back to show you the other slide that broke down um, into other categories in the DSM-4. So now the DSM-5, since May of last year, we have ASD. Autism Spectrum Disorder. And so you can see the social and communication, all part of that diagnosis, and the restricted stereotype behavior. So it's re those two areas are still the same as the, the previous slide I showed you. This was the confusing part, which is fortunately, some of the change with using the DSM-5 is that this chart has gone away in our vocabulary. But if your child has been diagnosed in the past, you may still have one of these diagnoses on their reports. Um, and just in your conversation, it might be part of your comfort to, to use those terms. I think everybody still understands those, but we have really switched to ASD in our language. Um, but in the old diagnosis, it was this mouthful, pervasive developmental disorder. Pervasive means more than one area. And I showed you the slide, social communication, Developmental, this is a developmental disorder. So your child is going to make progress. And disorder means it's out of sequence. So when you think about development, you typically think that we're just gonna keep making gains. If you're making gains at a slower rate, you know that's a developmental delay. But if you're making a gain here and you're you can do math computations in like you know a 12 year old and your social skills uh, your play skills might be more like a five year old you could just see that there's an, a sequence that's out of order and that's what disorder means it's out of sequence okay so it's not so I just think that's important to understand developmental delay and disorder because school systems so these are medical diagnoses by the way school systems often use developmental delay as their diagnosis on the IEP, and they are allowed to do that to age seven. Um, but in your mind, 
um, you may want to go for more accuracy of an autism spectrum disorder, okay? And that is a code on an IEP, it says autism. So now we have all this vocabulary. What does the old vocabulary look like? It still was autistic disorder. So kids have more difficulty with the language and with the social skills, taking your perspective. This category doesn't necessarily talk about restricted behaviors, but everybody with an ASD diagnosis has restricted stereotype behaviors. That's across the board. But we pretty much look at communication and social skills when we were looking at these um, names. And PDD NOS, again, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, was a little confusing to folks because kids can make a lot of gains and look like they are um, more like a child with Asperger's, very high functioning. The difference here is when you started off with a more of a speech and language problem. So the children who had, have Asperger's disorder diagnosis um, communicate very fluently, still have some issues in language, especially social language, but the amount of language and starting off with early language kind of differentiated those two categories. So many of our kids that today have an ASD diagnosis had these previous diagnoses in their reports. So autistic disorder, PDD, NOS, Asperger's disorder. So nothing's wrong in looking at your papers and your evaluations, but no one's really going to eventually use those categories. It'll just be the autism spectrum disorder. These two categories were um, very rare. So Rett's syndrome is um, a female disorder, genetic disorder, um, and it's a very regressive. That, that's unusual. And childhood disintegrative disorder, that's really for older kids who develop symptoms along the spectrum. So most kids didn't even get in those categories. Any questions about the old language? Because we're really going to have to get comfortable with this new language of autism spectrum disorder, ASD. So everybody gets lumped together, but everybody's so different. So how do you figure that out? Now this has really not been used that much, but this is where it's headed. There will be levels of severity, these specifiers. So I showed you autistic disorder, PDD, NOS, Asperger's. Now these levels are really to help us to look at the differences in communication and social. So I can be a child who has a lot of communication but I have a lot of trouble in interacting with other people socially. So you can separate out into different levels the different skill sets. So communications can be different levels, social can be different levels. Okay? And yes? When do um, doctors start telling you at what level their child is at? Because I've been told that because my daughter is only two and a half, almost three, that I won't know what level she is until she's six or seven. It, just to let you know, it's so new um, that people really aren't comfortable giving levels yet. Okay. And until we get norms and we're practicing it more, I'm, I'm really not sure that I can say we're ready for even at age six, but I'm hoping in three years that'll all be very clear. Um, but the difference is, it's going to mean how much intensity of services you're going to get. So it's not just a, you know, the diagnosis and then the level. How does this translate to resources? So if your child has any kind of special area of need, and we're going to jump to all of this also, any kind of special area of need, you want to work on the problem that's presented at the moment you see it and as it shifts or you add new things, you're gonna to continue to work because the brain, this is so important, the brain is what we call plastic, there's neuroplasticity. You're making, you're making new connections, rich new connections. And we used to think, oh, it has to be done by age five, but that's not true. We know the brain is making these rich new connections. Every time you practice something, you make a new connection in the brain and up to age 18, 19. So there's lots of time to work on rich connections. However, think about it. Your child might be practicing a rich connection in lining up cars. 
and they've got that down and they know exactly if you move anything a quarter of an inch and maybe they're not practicing on something else that you wish was more functional. So practice, practice, practice and practicing areas that you want those kinds of connections. So I just am going to put this in here because we have an ASD diagnosis, the Autism Spectrum Disorder. There's something also called a social communication disorder. This is different than the ASD diagnosis. And I just really need you to pay attention because the difference is a child who does not have the repetitive stereotype behaviors. So this is also newly being used. Um, if a child doesn't have these repetitive behaviors, they could lose the ASD diagnosis. And then you would really be working on social communication. And how that translates into resources and services, we haven't really seen that that much. Um, if you already have a di diagnosis under the DSM-4, I haven't seen anybody lose their diagnosis. No one's going back to take that away. I'm sorry, say that again. Okay. So if you um, had a diagnosis in the dsm 4 in one of these three areas, I haven't seen anybody go take that away from a child. How, because children, as they practice social skills, communication skills, they are looking more successful. But no one's going back to take away the fact that they have had this autism spectrum diagnosis. But children newly diagnosed may not have these restricted behaviors and really fall in this category. You still want to work on social and communication skills if your child has that delay. Is, it, is the language making sense? This is a vocabulary. You're just pulling together those three important pieces because you want to be working on the social and the communication and the behaviors that are more functional. Yeah. So for example, if a child displays the constant repetitive, uh, you know, they, like they have to have a particular thing or they keep going back to it, um, but yet they're, they are social, then they would not be under the social communication. Right. And so they're social, they may require less support in the social area, but in terms of um, possibly anxiety management and their um, ability to be more flexible, um, that might be more of a severe issue for the child. So, you know, you really want to think about where your child's strengths are and use strengths to, and work through those weakness areas. Um, about that is that children all want to be comfortable. So when you repeat something, it's very predictable. It's very comforting. Um, and when you practice something a lot, it's your skill set. Cal Ripken knows how to throw that ball without thinking. I'd have to stop, think, and plan. So it is practice that really does solidify our skills. So practicing other areas um, and working on flexibility is a lot of the therapeutic services that you're going to be receiving. Now this is a lot of information, but every child who has an autism spectrum disorder has other issues and that's how you see differences between people. Okay, this is a big area and I can tell you that children with an ASD diagnosis all have some issue in the attention area. And there's some subsets, so a lot of what we just talked about, that um, stereotype behavior, is selective attention. I select to pay attention to pens. I have a guy who loves office supplies and he stops looking at me and he really starts paying attention to this object in my hand because he, he knows more about pens than anybody. So it's what you select to pay attention to that can be a distractor. In my, my environment, if I'm saying this, you know, when I have a cue to go to attention, you all followed my finger to the board, but if I I'm distracted by this big preferred interest area, you know, I've lost attention. Another area of attention is just distractions. So I'm moving when I'm talking. That could throw off somebody. I'm hoping that a cue like pointing does help attention. So we want to give our children visual cues 
just to keep their attention. Um, impulsivity is actually at the level of the brain and it is something that's very difficult to manage. If I do something before I thought it through, I might see a piece of uh, candy laying on the floor and I dart out to get it. I might hear the music from the ice cream truck and I open the door and I run out without money and a, and a plan and permission. So these are issues that present safety concerns. Um, managing impulsivity is very important for our safety. And I'm just going to throw this out here, that many children actually need medication management for that neurological impulsivity. So it's not just I hearing dad say, don't do that. It's not reminding myself of the rules. It really truly could be a disorganization, and I'm very impulsive. So just be aware of impulsivity, because those issues really are very difficult for kids to control. And along with another area of self-control, self-regulation is hyperactivity. You know, we all know the kid who has the wiggles. So if your child is wiggling to the point of falling out of their chair, um, and they really, you know, can only stay seated for three minutes, and they've got to get up and move. Um, so hyperactivity can be a, just a, certainly another obstacle to learning. Oftentimes, there's medication management for hyperactivity, true hyperactivity. But um, for the most part, we try behaviorally to increase sitting. We reward sitting and paying attention and staying focused. Um, we, we try to increase the, the period of time that a child can stay focused. Academics, um, social interaction really take a lot of attention. So this is a big area, certainly it's a big area for teachers. They love to talk about how your child is attending more. So it is important for them and for you to hear, but that's not the only thing for school. So um, also hyper-focused. So that comes back to, uh, you know, I have this preferred restricted area and I get hyper-focused. Some children are not hearing and they're not really paying attention to um, two things at once. They may be standing barefoot in some cold area because they're so hyper focused on looking at something they really enjoy. So be thinking that my child isn't always able to do two and three things at the same time. What is it that they're really selecting to pay attention to? Speech and language. We talked about a little bit that that's probably where most of you recognize that your child was having delay. So um, these areas of the brain, um, these short connections are more our motor skills. So babies move first, and then um, the longer connections are our fine motor and our speech and language. So those come in naturally later in our development. But if so, if you see motor delays, you start working on motor skills, and then you work on the fine motor skills, these little muscles, and um, you work on the language skills. So as you see development having certain need areas, you work on those. Many children have a lot of frustrations with their fine motor. And um, just to let you know, the discipline that works on that is occupational therapy. But occupational therapy also works on sensory integration. So you've got all of these, you know, the, the taste, the smell, the touch, sound, and you're bombarded. But for the most part, after age three, you start to integrate that. Oh, I don't have to watch the cars out the window. I don't have to listen to the fan. You are able to s select what to pay attention to sensory-wise. But many people just don't even know where their body is because they're not getting enough sensory input just for balance or movement. So a lot of kids, you know, they get to the top of the slide and their sensory system doesn't integrate all of that spatial um, awareness and or their where their balance is or you know where their feet are and where their eyes are they don't plan for the distance difference and so there, it's very complicated so if I don't know where my body is in space and I am also bothered by maybe bright lights and, and loud sounds it's the startle Star so if I'm prepared like my child might like to crash things a lot however if it's a startle the bells start ringing or something 
that they're unprepared for, it's very un unsettling. And um, it's really hard to self-regulate when you don't have this sensory system organized. So again, occupational therapy, a good occupational therapist is going to work on fine motor and the sensory. Now, I, um, I put emotional disorder. I know that sounds um, a little um, confusing, but our kids are much higher risk for anxiety. If I can't anticipate something, I'm going to be anxious when it's a surprise. If I anticipate something was negative, I'm going to avoid it. So I might not want to walk into the building that I remember the doctor had and gave me a shot. Um, if I am in a dangerous situation, we are hardwired to get out of there, which is to flee, to fight it off, or to freeze. So we're, you know, that's a self-protection. We don't have to stop and think and plan and evaluate. We want to get safety fast. So flight, which we call elopement, fight, we call meltdowns and tantrums, and freeze. So kids who just, you know, cry and get frozen and locked into, you know, one position and you, uh, they're, you know, it's hard to get them engaged in something. So anxiety management is important. We want to be able to have deep breathing and to be able to have strategies to calm down, rubbing, back rubbing, holding something, um, putting something in your mouth. Oftentimes putting some, you know, kids carry things around and or, or put something in their mouth or do both, put the thing in their hand in their mouth. So we calm ourselves down that way. So there's some very predictable ways that kids are managing anxiety. It's not always the teacher's joy to have a kid, you know, having something in their hand, playing with it. So, you know, there's a balance here of all these needs and what we can um, allow in certain situations. We certainly don't want to allow elopement, but it's a natural response. So, you know, they were actually going to call the ASD diagnosis the wandering disorder. There was some thought of that because it's such a common behavior is to run away from something that makes me very anxious. So this all helps to see how everybody is having purposeful communication even though it's not language, but there's, there's a reason things are happening. Um, if you see a lot of irritability, this is sometimes a red flag for depression. Again, depression is something that really does need to be taken seriously and often medically managed. And sometimes anxiety also medically managed. Um, definitely as kids get much older if it's a big issue. Okay, executive functioning. This is a little complex and it really goes back that anybody who has an attention deficit disorder often has difficulties organizing themselves. We could have a very bright person be the absent-minded professor. We all know what that meant. So they got up and they left their papers on their floor and they went out without their keys, even though they have lots of intelligence. So just to let you know that we're not talking about intelligence when we're talking about these things. Executive functioning for you guys to remember is one, to select to pay attention to what's important. You're selecting to pay attention to me and not doing your grocery list. Okay, so one executive functioning is attention. The next is memory. Now again, you practice something, you practice it, you remember it. Some people need five times to practice something. Some people need 105 times to practice something. So we all have different levels of memory and we want to be supporting memory. So if there's something that supports your child's memory, it's a routine. So that I don't have to remember the five steps to get out the door in the morning. I go through a routine, it's chunked together, it's really become sort of one memory and it really lightens the load. The other one that's important is organization. You all kept adjusting the time and figuring out how to get here today. Um, you were probably reacting to the parking situation, that's different. Your kids are reacting all the time. They're not organizing. They didn't make the plan. They didn't say, oh, let me get started, get to the end, and evaluate, and then check and correct and adjust. They're not doing the checking and fixing part. 
but you all know that you have an or different ways to organize. You might have um, been given some pictures that the, your child uses for a routine. You might have been given, your you might list for your child when you do this, then you do that. Something that makes it easy for an organized behavior. Um, without an organized um, plan, your child may just not be able to pay attention to something, not remember something, not like something, they want to avoid it. Now, you know, brushing your teeth and doing all those bathroom habits may not be of no interest to your child, but the reward is you get out to the school bus and you like getting on the bus and going to school. So it is really important to get through a sequence to get to your goal. And it can be a nice reward, something really preferred if you want that sequence to be successful. Um, that's us organizing our children. They have trouble planning. So they're not gonna say, I need to get to the bus a little earlier. I need to um, make a change in my schedule. You're gonna have to be making those plans. Typically, your child's reacting. So you might re they might react to a change in schedule. They might react to um, you um, going out of sequence. If you're out of sequence, it's helpful to know that there's a change. So any way that's gonna help my world be predictable and, and have clarity, that's, your, that's where you can help with the organizing. That's a lot of information. So what is not a successful part of executive functioning for your kids? Planning, self-regulating, understanding, putting awareness of what your needs are first, being able to be flexible. So those are all still skills to keep working on. They're emerging. It's gonna take a lot of practice a lot of practice to problem solve. So in the meantime, I might make the wrong choices. I might problem solve and not see all of the details so that I make the best choice. Okay, um, just to add autoimmune. Auto means automatic, so our guys are at higher risk for autoimmune problems. So typically there's a lot of respiratory problems, asthma, allergies, gut issues, um, constipation issues, diarrhea, and skin, a lot of eczema. So, um, you know, it's hard to have health issues that are going on and making you uncomfortable and you're scratching a lot or distracted by other bodily functions. Habits, it's really hard to change habits, especially bad habits, because if I'm more rigid, I hold on. So there, I can give you lots of, uh, lots of examples of bad habits, but you might have your own list of something you've let go and it's become reinforced and you wish that that wasn't a habit that has been allowed. Um, classic is the greedy give Every time I walk into Walmart, I buy you a toy. That becomes a habit, try to break that one. Um, it's very hard to undo, so just try to get through the habits that you want. Um, when you're, when you're starting to venture out in the world. Environmental factors, so we talked about all these different things, um, change and um, distractions and confusion. So if I want to have a birthday party and I have 15 people, what a confusing situation. Everyone's doing something different and, and making all kinds of um, noises and things are popping and maybe they're, they're running through an obstacle course and I can't manage all that and um, people are talking at me but I'm just using my eyes and I'm really ignoring some of the language. So try to go to a birthday party when all that bombardment is hitting you. So we could see why you know, many times we have situations that don't, we don't make the best plan and we need to accommodate our child, think that through where, what communication they're gonna give us back. They may elope. They may melt down. They may freeze and cry. So some of that's very predictable. I've talked a lot about this, but I feel like it's really important to understand because everybody's different. And these factors are all the piece that helps to differentiate us. Yes? It's funny what you just said. Um, I gave my granddaughter five, uh, her fifth year, uh, five year old birthday party 
and clowns, magicians, all this mm -hmm. stuff. And she stood there for an hour and a half with a spoon, looking at her spoon, which she normally does. So I was looking at your sheet there, and I was wondering if that was the, imp the impulsivity. Um. Well, actually, I was thinking more it might be that she needs the predictability of that of something in her hand because she's very anxious in this situation. There's a lot of sensory overload. So she's moving to something that's very functional for her to calm herself down um, and, you know, sort of block out what's a little overwhelming for her. And, um, you know, it's hard developmentally for a lot of kids with people in costume, so clowns can be confusing. Uh, there, there's a lot of factors there. I mean, she could have impulsivity also in that she said, I see that I'm going to do something else, and it might not have been as safe. Um, so I'm um, like putting your hand right in the cake or something. You know, there's lots of different ways we can be impulsive, and it made sense to her, but not to us. Um, any other questions? Okay. So we're going to talk about resources now. Um, a couple people have come in late. So we have um, Howard County, Baltimore County, and PG County. Montgomery. Montgomery. Baltimore County. Baltimore County. Howard. 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 Okay, good. So you guys are all parents. Yes. Okay. No. No, I'm uh, ADL buddies. Oh, okay. Good. So we have other staff here today too. Okay. Now. I know that you're in another county, but your kids come from all over the state. Um, if there's something specific to a deaf population and you want to ask, let me know. Okay. So what do you want families to know? So if you were going to do any service for them, give them at least ideas of resources. I will be very honest, Maryland is not at the top of the 50 states in being able to be offering great resources that you can get right away. So there is paper application, online application, making sure you've covered all your bases, homework for you guys, okay? The first one I want you all to know about is this autism waiver. A waiver is anything that would carve out of your income. So your income does not affect the autism waiver. So everybody whose child gets an ASD diagnosis should make a phone call and get on this registry. It takes three minutes. It's just your basic demographics. Now why would you do that? Because there are many children who um, need a medical assistance card. So you can have primary insurance and medical assistance will pick up the difference. Or it could be your primary insurance medical assistance, which can be a gold card for resources. Medical assistance, you know, covers services at a center base like here at Kennedy and other center based services. Um, so one, you want the health care that comes with it. And two, there are resources that actually come into your home. So working with your child on their communication goals, their behavioral goals, their social goals, um, going into the community. Because the autism waiver is not given to you because your child has a diagnosis only, there are a couple other stipulations. You have to have 12 hours of special ed services. It can be your one-to-one -one aid for the hour, and that's good to know. The piece that I have to tell you is shown on this graph. So there were 900 slots in the very beginning. And then there were an extra 100 added last year. So now that was at 2013. But you can see the number of people even at 2011. And there are only 1,000 slots. So people who had registered, they had to get off the autism waiver so that somebody else could get on. <coughs> Excuse me. So Many people are on for like two or three years, some even more. So usually it's about 150-ish, it's not exact science, kids get on in fiscal year, July, because 150 came off. So we fought really hard to get an extra 100 slots. This is a really important program. So you're eligible for it, 
but you're not entitled, so you have to get on a waiting list. So that's why I say, make the call today if you're not on the list. Even if you don't have the diagnosis clarified yet, by the time your name's gonna come up, because you're applying in 2014, your child's gonna be a lot older, and your diagnosis will be clarified. Yes? I just put my daughter on the waiting list a month ago. They said it was a five-year waiting list. Well, it's not really fair to, for them to say that to you because you can see this is where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Those families who put their child on 2006 are at the countdown to get the resource. You're going to be up here, and your number is high. But kids are going to come off and kids are going to go on and eventually you're going to have an older child and if they still need resources and have special ed services even up to age 20 they can get on the autism waiver. So it's like an insurance policy. What I was saying is that Maryland's not at the top of having entitled services. Wouldn't it be great that as soon as you got your ASD diagnosis and you had special ed services this happened. Personally though the way the resources are, have worked out it's better to have your child a little bit older because they're going to go into the community with this person. They're going to, the person's going to be in your home. So I think actually that piece of it works out. There will be kids though on the list that will get older than 21 and they'll never get this resource just because of the, the numbers unless we work to increase the number of openings. And it was a dad in Montgomery County that developed the, this whole idea. So parents can have input. We just got 100 more slots. We want more. Excuse me. Yes. Oh, okay. How long can they stay? Well, the, well, that was just an average. So you have an actual autism waiver plan. You have a coordinator. So it's managed through the health department and the board of education. And they, so your goals are set and then you review your goals. You want to keep adding goals. You want to keep, you know, if you're the person who's getting the service, you want to keep working on the progress. So technically, no one's going to meet all of their goals. But there's going to be a point where they say, you've made enough progress, and they're going to try to kick you off because they want to get more people on. So it's not exact science, but it really is like you walk into your IEP team and you said, this is my progress, this is my next change. You walk into your autism waiver team and say, these are my problems. And you know, it's like you think in the other side of your brain, you're, you're more problem oriented, okay? Yes. Two questions. Um, first, how uh, do we continue to? I mean, do we stay totally in, in touch with the people doing this waiver process? Actually, you can call. Thing? You can call and find out where your number is on the list. Okay. Just so, lots of parents like to see their number go down. It, it's you know, it's comforting. Um, if you move, you need to give them your new address and phone number. But it is part of the Board of Education also, so they, there's other ways that they can find families just by looking at the, you know, the education so they never, uh, registration. You never get, you know, dropped for some weird reason. No, only if you don't have enough hours of special ed. How do you get that? Well, you're in special education for reading, writing, math, or social, emotional goals. Child, yeah. Okay. And your aid, a one-to-one -one aid counts in those hours. For some kids, they don't need the... Um, reading, writing, and math, and they have just social emotional goals, and they have an aid to help with attention issues. So, okay, I'm still a little confused. Mm -hmm. She's mentioned the reading, writing. She can't um, read, she can't talk, and okay. she can't write. So, she's probably getting assistance through the Department of Education in special education at school. In school. Okay. Yeah. So, one of the each time she's one-on-one, -on -one, that's... Oh, no, I didn't, I, I, I didn't explain it well. So for some children, they're not actually in a special ed class or getting pulled out by a special educator or getting special ed direct services. So those children who are getting just assisted by an aide around attention needs um, are also eligible. Because you don't get special education you, because you have an autism spectrum diagnosis. You get special, special education because you have a reading, writing, math, social, emotional set of goals. If you, if you are above average, average to above average, you may not have any reading, writing, and math goals. I just want to make sure you understand you can have social, emotional, behavioral goals 
and that warrants an individual education plan too just for those goals and not every county looks at those goals on an IEP, the individual education plan. Okay, so that is through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that you have a right to a free appropriate education based on your individual needs. I'm gonna to switch to something a little more complicated. The American with Disabilities Act gives people the right to be accommodated given their disabilities in school, in your housing, in the community, in your job, in college. And that's where an aid comes in. Those are accommodations. And so um, some children get a 504 plan because they just need to be accommodated. So weakness areas are more of the direct special ed services. But you can be accommodated with features like an aid, sitting close to the teacher, and all those other. Did that make it? So, yeah. Okay. Being in a special ed, um, special ed class, would that count as 12, one of the hours? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, by the time you all have made this call, put your child on the list, and you see the long list, you are going to have this all totally understood. So don't worry about it now. Just, just do that thing of about making that phone call and getting on and getting a number assigned. So yes. Is it the the number said about a, a thousand spots? Is this by state or by county? It's just the state of Maryland. This is just a Maryland program. So is it first come first serve or based on severity of child? And if no, so, is it, it is severe? first come first serve. Okay. That's why we're way back in 2006. Whoops. Um, Wow, I wish we knew about it back then. I know. <laughs> I know. I talk to teachers all the time, and they go, oh my goodness, our parents didn't know about this. So it is so easy, and just do that one right away. OK? Thank you. So another piece of information financially. There's, so we do have all those laws about, um, especially about being accommodated, and and the right to free appropriate education, that's the federal government. The federal government also has the Supplemental Security Income Program. This actually comes out of your taxes, not the small Social Security tax that we pay. So Supplemental Security Income is um, a program for someone who hasn't worked uh, five years, four quarters, and that applies to all kids. And there has to be a medical, a, a moderate to severe diagnosis. So that's another qualification. And your family has to meet the income. So this one is income specific. So it's not a very generous cutoff. Um, if you're over 40,000 and you have a large family, it's a little bit different. Um, but under 40,000 and a smaller family, you're probably, you know, you're at that cutoff and they count child support and all these other issues. So I can't give you exact number because other incomes are factored in. But if you do meet the criteria for a supplemental security income, you apply through Social Security and you apply for your child only and they would get medical assistance, again, a gold card in this, through the state of Maryland. They would get a benefit through the federal government. So right now it's um, $710 a month minus some other incomes that you may get. So there's a financial benefit and the medical assistance card. So many children have, I and mean, it's just for the child, it's not for the whole family, supplemental security income, SSI. Now, a couple things about this. Do, um, there is an income cutoff for the family. There is a medical diagnosis. ASD is a moderate to severe diagnosis for eligibility. So that is important to document. So you probably have an evaluation report with the diagnosis on it. Attach that to, you know, take that with you with a checklist of things to apply for SSI. They do take a number of months to make determination, but um, it gets backdated to the month you apply. And the other piece about this is that at age 18, if your income's too high, at 18, your child can apply for their own SSI. But do not have more than $2,000 in their bank account. And you can't dump it right before they're 18. 
So you, if you are going to have other monies, that's where the special needs trusts and making your child beneficiary of insurance and all these other ideas come in so that you can still save for your child, but they can't have more than $2,000 in their own bank account. Okay. And they can apply when they're 18 for themselves, yeah. So the special needs trust, you're saying they can't have more than 2000 there? No, that's where your other monies go. Special needs trusts, that's all something, and it's expensive, but it's something a lawyer would set up or, you know, you would get the right financial advisor for that. Um, but this program is really a very important piece. If you have an income and your child has a disability, please apply for SSI. Okay, for fa so now we've talked about medical assistance through the autism waiver and through SSI. Or you can apply to the Department of Social Services and get medical assistance in a package of food stamps and cash assistance. Another way to get medical assistance is the Maryland Children's Health Insurance Plan, MCHIP. So the cutoff for a family of four right now is about $76,000. So your child would get medical assistance. So the if, it's, um, if you have an insurance for your child, you can't apply. Okay, but if your child does not have insurance and you make under 76000 you can apply. At a certain point, they do charge a premium. I think it's about $50 at about the halfway mark. So, um, but $50 a month for many families to get thousands and thousands of dollars worth of services is very valuable. So, MCHIP um, is a fourth way to get medical assistance. Okay, and just then there's just some special monies out there and if you really feel like you are confused or have a serious issue, um, talk to a social worker, you know, we know where some other monies are um, and other applications. And there are some specialty agencies like the, um, Kennedy has the Family Support Services, Abilities Network, which used to be the old Epilepsy Association, they have some monies. Arc of Baltimore, the Association for Retarded Citizens, they have some monies. So there's some little monies out there, little grants that you can apply for also. Um, don't overlook all of that, so make application. And there are more on the list than I've just named. Yes? So how do you find those other monies? Is there a central place, a central website? Okay. An advocate? Because sometimes you're picking at schools. You don't yes. Know what to do. Did you get the PowerPoint? I did not. Okay. Stacy will give you one. Um, at the very back of the PowerPoint, I have, we'll get to that, but it's like really good places for contacting to get information like that. As I said, I'm a clinical social worker, and uh, my team here are always available to answer questions. Okay, so this is another place to get funding. However, there have been some very big changes with Developmental Disabilities Administration. Okay, so I said Department of Social Services, and that's, that's where your medical assistance comes from. Department of Education, we spent a lot of energy thinking about what the school system um, can do to deliver services. Then this whole, uh, there's a whole other category. It's the Health Department, Department of Mental Health, and the Department of Developmental Disabilities. I want you to think about this like an insurance policy in that you'll sign up, you don't know if you're ever going to need it or not, but if you do, you don't want to be at the bottom of the list. So sign up, it's another thing. Now this application is about eight pages and you do have to send in proof of disability you can do it online, but I would still recommend you send in a report that has the diagnostic information. What you, let me just tell you what you're going to get, and then you'll, um, I'll tell you about the application. So this program used to cover everybody with a disability. And then they cut back to people over age 14 who are emerging to adulthood and adults. As of March this year, they really are only going to be thinking about adults. So they get involved when a child is getting close to ending um, their certificate program. For a child who's going to get a high school diploma, they get involved, but your child's already graduated because they use 21 as their adult cutoff. So what they do right now is they help to assess 
that there's a developmental disability, and then that there are adult services. So they're really important if your child's going to need adult services. Because at age 21, the state of Maryland has a, this whole year is an important year between 21 and 22, there's money that is given to a child who's just finished their certificate program in their 21st year, and that money is to be used with an adult provider agency where you manage you know, their business out of your, out of your home, but it's, it's about employment. It's about um, day programming. It's about um, uh, supporting you in your home. Could be actually residential living. So there, there are really a lot, there are many, many facets to adult um, planning. And I am going to talk about that at 1 o'clock today if anybody's interested in coming back. But that's a whole body of information. But this is important for you to get on the list so that when your child is becoming an adult that you have this resource. I'm just going to add that I think, because they tried it for one day and it got shot down, but I think that they are going to need you to have applied for DDA to get list money next year. It's a real possibility. I'll talk about lists in a minute. Okay. So DDA, you want to get on, you want to get this application done. Don't obsess on it. The first three pages, pick the worst day that your child has. Fill it out about your child. Make sure the social security number is your child. It's very hard to undo it later because they file everything under your child's social security number. Um, so the next section is about you, the guardian, parent, kinship, whatever status. You don't have to release information to any agency. They have a lot of release forms. And it says, what do you want? Just put, I want all the autism resources my child can get. And you, know, you don't have to belabor that, because the reality is that's just a point of entry. So they just need to see that your child has a diagnosis. And then it gets sent to another agency that they contract with. So there are three agencies right now. And what they do is they do this service called service coordination. And they come out and they meet you and your child. And they actually then get the details of your child's special need, your needs. It's your needs also. If you feel desperate, you need to make sure they understand all those issues. And unfortunately, they're not really going to serve you, but it does kind of put you in the queue to be reaching out for adult services. And you do want those adult services when your child's 21. You do want to get what's called TY or GTYI money that 21st year, because it's going to pay for adult services. Um, if you miss and you're older than 22, you know, that year, you're on a list of thousands and thousands of people waiting for some money to get to you. So, you know, follow the, that system. Okay, if you graduate from high school and you've got a period of anywhere from three to, you know, however many, two years, whatever, before you're 21, they can't get involved. And so there's a gap there you've got to fill. And again, I'll talk about that in the afternoon, but um, the other agency is DOORS, Division of Rehab Services. It's short term. There is a huge gap those three years between 17, 18, and 21. I just need you to know about that. And you don't have to make a determination about high school diploma or certificate until age 16. So you actually do have time. You don't have to be pushed into making that decision right away. You had a question? Yeah, forgive me, I'm a little confused. So we apply for this now or when the child is getting ready to graduate? You apply for it now, and then this will come up on the radar when your child's getting ready to graduate. She's five. Yeah, just, just, get, just, just want to get this application done. So I have to say, these are like insurance plans. You don't know if you're going to need it. But I also don't want you to miss the opportunity and be at the bottom of the list. So then when they graduate, let's say they're 17, 18, when they graduate, uh, they're on the program here. So in between that time, they could like possibly use doors or something like that. And then at 21, this would be Yeah, this kicks in at 21. And also, um, 
At age 14 in the state of Maryland, schools have to start talk about, talking about adult services if your child is, does have an IEP. So you'll hear this again, and you'll say, you know, I've already applied, and that, that's a good thing. Um, okay, so you know, your child may go to secondary education between 18 and 21 and never use this. It's okay if you apply, never use it. If you don't get to be developmentally disabled with this agency when your child's getting to be 21, you really only get su support services, you don't get the money for adult services. So there, that's something you'll worry about down the line, but I just want you to know this is a journey that you've entered and there are some steps along the way. Just kind of get this behind you and then you're gonna focus on treatment and education and, and enjoying your child. And then closer to graduation, you're going to have a lot of energies that you're going to put back into making planning again. Okay. So we're divided up into four regions in the state. So everybody in the Baltimore Howard County, we're all central region. Everybody in um, PG and Montgomery County, you're in the southern region. Okay. So what's this? Low intensity support services. Okay. There's a big change that happened this year. This money comes out of developmental disabilities budget. It's really the only thing they really plan to do for you who have children under the age of 21. But children and adults are eligible to apply for this $2,000 a year grant. And you can have one service or you could have several different services. But this has turned into a little bit of a mini nightmare. So for, the la for three years in a row, we had a day that we had to get the application in, July 1st. State of Maryland is a fiscal year. So you know we ramp up and we were getting everybody's application in. It has become so well known and it was such a nightmare that they divided it out. They lowered the ceiling from 3,000 to 2,000. But it's still a good chunk of change and you don't want to leave it on the table. It is for your child, for their non-insurance covered services. You can build an eight foot fence, you can have horseback riding in art class and camp and all these good resources. Um, however, you apply now in two, in two periods. You can apply during the month of July or the month of January. So for those families who applied in July, I'm just going to let you know, they still haven't figured out who's been eligible. So the letters have not come out yet as of last Friday for those people who applied in July. We're in September. So a lot of people in July asked for camp. So I'm just going to give you the heads up. You, if, Okay, two things. One, it's a lottery system. So children and adults, it's a big pile, they're going to draw down a certain amount until they spent the money. And then they're going to let you know late that you got the money. So if you sign up for a camp and it's $1,500, just be aware you may end up having to work out a payment plan because you didn't get selected or you didn't get it in a timely fashion. So it's, it's a mess. But if you didn't get anything in July, you can reapply the whole thing again in January. If you got something in July, they don't want to see you in January. But you also get to do this every year. So the application itself isn't that bad. It's two pages, but it has to be perfect. Can't leave out anything because they're looking to just help a few people. The budget's six and a half million dollars for the whole state. It's divided out into those four regions. So you guys have, um, you know, it's community resources and Howard and Baltimore County, you've got Penmar and you've got now you have the knowledge of this and you want to not leave it on the table so go to the low intensity support services website they just came out with a new packet so it's a little better organized for your needs to see what you can ask for to see how to get the application right questions we can help you um, DDA can help you but, but it's it's messy right now but parents do get that money and they're all we're all cheering for them okay Okay, so let's move on. Um, okay, when you've 
everybody with autism typically struggles with some of their basic developmental milestones. Toilet training, eating with um, you know flexible eating instead of restricted. A lot of kids like the bland diet. This color, foods this color, things that aren't going to involve a lot of chewing. So there's a lot of crunchy, soft textures or salty or sugar. I mean, there's a lot of food selectivity. So food, um, delayed toileting, and um, sleep dysregulation, falling asleep or staying asleep. And then, of course, the tantruming for all the reasons that we went through when we look at all the developmental impact. So I need help. This Department of Behavioral Psychology, we have actually a clinic to work on those developmental issues or to work on other specific behaviors. Okay. Um, you can get a free service through DDA. Um, basically, they give you a pack. It's Humanum in this area, Resource Connections. I mean, it's not a lot of support to you as the parent in implementing the behavior plan. So it's much easier to walk in when somebody says, okay, this is the problem. This is where we're going to get started today. And it, you're working with somebody instead of kind of given an external package that you've got to figure out how to put in place. Okay, um, therapeutic behavioral support services is a valuable resource for families who have medical assistance. So if your child has high risk behaviors, difficult behaviors, intensive needs, this is an in-home program that medical assistance pays for. So you can get after school and weekend therapeutic services and there, there's a whole set of agencies that have developed to provide those in-home supports. Okay, typically you're going to, I mean, you're going to need somebody on your team to help you make this application, either a behaviorist, a social worker, some mental health person. A physician can fill it out too, but just to let you know that there, you know, this is really a mental health services service when you see behavior. Okay. Respite care. How many of you think you take care of yourselves? Oh, nobody. I'm not surprised. Of course you are feeling like there's been no joy and um, no time for yourselves or your spouse or um, um, just, just taking a break from the stress. So the research shows that you can handle high stress, but you need a carve out of the stress. That's good coping. Respite care is giving you a break. You don't have to have a doctor's appointment. I have a mom who just takes a nap for hours and hours and hours knowing her child is safely being cared for by somebody else, but she could not have afforded that. So there are agencies that give you some financial support so that you can pay your um, babysitter. It's not a huge amount. And as you know, the shrinking monies, there's competition for monies, but there are um, respite programs and um, as a clinical social worker on this agencies at the back page that's another thing to start to do some research for there's some lovely respite uh, programs um, for instance uh, Camp Fairly Manor is going is working to make their facility year-round so that their respite weekends or a camp week that's respite and your child's really enjoying themselves there are some expensive respite programs um, there are some smaller monies that you get to pay your provider, so there's there's a range. Um, so I've just listed some types of agencies that you might want to look for monies for respite care, but it is so important. And I, I mean, if your child has seizures or a GT tube, there are still respite programs for kids with medical needs and developmental needs. And as a social worker, I, I can help you. Okay, education. We talked a lot about it already. However, not most people are satisfied. I don't want you to think that every kid who has a special need has to go to war against the school system. But many times there is um, there's a misunderstanding from the parents' perspective of what their rights are. You are one member of the team. So there are all those other people on your Team. So you aren't the only decision maker. You're not the 50% of the vote or the 
hopefully in a good process, you get a copy of an individual education plan draft. And with parents fought for this, actually in PG County. It's now five days you get your draft copy before your IEP meeting. You have time to look at it, talk to your providers. There are a couple things on the IEP I really want you to pay attention to. Not just what they've written down for assessments and then the goals and implementation. What diagnostic code did, you, did they use? Autism is one of the 14 diagnoses. Other health impaired is typically ADHD. Um, sometimes it's a, an emotional dis, uh, disability, but most often it's developmental delay. And then it's kind of watered down a little bit in that it's almost like a general IEP for many of the counties, and I won't pick on all the counties except for PG County and Baltimore City. So I just want you to be really mindful of looking at the IEPs. Um, and it is um, another area is that there's a parent input section. Most parents just get surprised when that comes up and they say, I just want the best for my child. I want them to have a really good year. No. I want you to think about this ahead of time. I want you to write an agenda down for yourself. If it's something that you really want every member of the team, like it has communication, behavior, things that your child likes and doesn't like, things you do and you don't do, if you really want to guide them, make a copy for everybody on that team. It's just going to go into a document if you verbalize it, and that's okay too. You, you can read it to the team and make sure or hand it to them to put it in there. But you can make this really useful. Um, and I think that it's important to know that's when your voice then is heard. Every member of that team has something that typically isn't just um, you know, reading a report and, and getting this document it's signed off on. It used to be that you could withhold your signature. Not anymore. The first time you sign an IEP, that's giving the school system permission to have an individual education plan around their academic and social emotional weaknesses. So not because they have a diagnosis, but because they have a documented reading, writing, and or math, disability, and social emotional behavioral. Don't forget that because lots of teams don't think to put those, those particular goals. If you have speech therapy, it's gonna be communication goals. If you have fine motor, sensory integration, you're gonna have OT goals. You're gonna have um, sometimes social work, psychology goals to meet social skill development. Um, so you've, it gets very confusing. You've got people throwing out numbers to you. You've, you're hearing things about your child, so you've got a lot of emotions. Then you've got all these different disciplines, and it's, it you know, takes a while to figure out what each discipline does. So there's other ways to get information before you just show up once a year, by law, annual review. But you can have parent conferences. You can find out from your teachers, do they want email, phone calls, parent conferences, communication books, um, visits. You know, it's just really good for you guys to feel empowered to know what's going on. And then you're a valuable member of the team. Because actually, at the team meeting, you really want that just to be your handshake, that everybody's agreeing on the diagnosis, on the goals, on the implementation of those goals and the assignment. Okay, so here's an important thing. Not everybody's happy with their assignment. Most people can get through those first three parts, but then there's disagreement about the assignment. Do I want this implemented in an inclusive setting? That's a mainstream class with special ed supports or a little bit of pullout. Do I want it in a special ed program with a small ratio, and many of the reports in a medical facility recommend small group education. Now, they don't have to accept our medical recommendations because you're in the education system now, and they have their education recommendations. So it's, it's not always a smooth um, conversation. And at that point, I just have to say, because of all those dynamics, bring somebody with you. It doesn't have to be a paid advocate. You can see um, paid advocates are very expensive. Um, there's a range between 50 and 150 an hour. But they're invaluable if you need someone who understands the diagnosis and knows what's going on in that classroom and can 
help the team with the right goals and the right implementation. These are all your child's civil rights, the right to an appropriate education. How up, however, the Supreme Court has made that a right to a minimally appropriate education. So you have to prove more intensive needs and then if you really think the assignment should be more specialized, more intensive. So the Kennedy School. We're not part of the Kennedy School, by the way. We're you know, here at the Autism Center. To get a placement there, you've already possibly um, been in a special ed class, and then maybe you've had a special ed school, and then you've moved to non-public. So the school system has inclusive education, regular ed, special ed help in the classroom, pull out for some resources, special ed schools, and then this whole area of non-public. It's very expensive. I mean, we're talking um, like probably $80,000 to go to Kennedy School because transportation costs are huge and then the level of intensive need. The school system has to say that they cannot educate the child in their county. So most of the counties are really pulling back in. PG County said this year, we're not sending anybody out. That's not true. Every rule can get broken, but it's an uphill battle. If you need a special school, I'm just going to tell you, you need an advocate. So there are educational consultants and there are attorneys. So attorneys are if you are really having your civil rights denied for your child. And an educational consultant is if you really just need this IEP to be tweaked, um, helping everybody to feel like they're on the same page. I can talk more about that if anybody has questions, but um, this website, the Maryland Disability Law Center, has this little booklet, Special Education Rights and Wrongs, a lot of good guidelines. If you disagree, there's something called due process. The first step is mediation, and the second step is due process, which is actually a hearing, and it's out in, um, in this area, in Hunt Valley, in PG County. It's where you would go to traffic court, um, some minor misdemeanors. So these are administrative law judges. So they have a bias to support the system. And so you really have to have a strong case to show up there. So there's very, it's less than 10% chance of winning. So I just want you to know, you really want to work with your team. You really want to make nice. You really want to have information and sharing and and really be in a collaborative um, relationship with them as much as possible. Okay, um, this new um, curriculum, Common Core, and then there's going to be a new assessment. Um, this PARC, um, Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. But just to let you know, that's going to be coming along. And um, the Common, don't be scared of the Common Core, but the Everyone's adjusting to what the curriculum needs are. Just kind of vaguely, it's raising the bar so that kids, the demands to meet curriculum are a little harder, higher functioning. But certainly the special ed teachers are making adjustments within the common core curriculum. But um, you know, things, things are pretty demanding in the school setting. So even in special ed, teachers still have to meet curriculum goals for each of the counties. Um, so it's good to know what those curriculum goals are. Pull up, see what kindergarten is requiring for this year. And think about how that's going to intersect. Because remember, your children have strengths and weaknesses in different places. Okay. Um, there are a couple other things. Oh, by the way, we do have our own lawyer service here. Um, there's a small fee required, and um, it's just another special education attorney um, here through Project Heal. I think there's a brochure in the back if you want to check that out. I have a number of families who homeschool because their child isn't really matching where the options are in their county. They're maybe between, you know, too inclusive, too much special ed or whatever the formula is. And there are some networks with that. But remember, education is preparing your child for adulthood. That's the goal. So any, you know, any communication, social skill, 
functional behavior, you really do want this opportunity to make the school system work for them, to prepare them to be in the real world. Um, we could, you guys could probably make it more perfect than maybe a classroom teacher, because you know your child best, but just think that at the end of the day, you're gonna be launching into the community, into the, to the adult world, so you want preparedness and community resources. Okay, parent support. All of us want you to take care of yourselves. This is, it's hard to be a parent. It's stressful to understand all this material that I'm talking about today. It takes grandparents supporting, it takes siblings, but you also get affected. You've got your own emotions. Um, there are a lot of places to take care of your needs. The Autism Society of America has been around a long time. You can call them. Um, they have Spanish speaking help now, but these local chapters are really starting to work in a very functional way for um, some of the social needs. For instance, the Baltimore Chesapeake chapter, they have um, a conference line now. You don't have to go to the meeting, but you can be connected to them on a teleconference, just a dial in. And their group have taken responsibility to have an activity every month. So I saw this morning, get on, get on these websites, let these um, updates come on your internet at home. Today one was about free art classes um, in nearby here for 12 to 18 year olds. And then there was another um, activity, a very social activity. So there are many more opportunities for families to get together and to be supportive of each other or supportive of your kids and enjoy activities. Um, you don't have to live in Bal the Baltimore Chesapeake region, which is Baltimore City and Baltimore County. You could be in Hartford because they don't really have their own and you could be at Anne Arundel. Howard, you guys have a wonderful ASA chapter. So you not only have the general chapter with social activities, you also have some small groups of parents getting together to plan for transition services to adulthood. Housing, there's all kinds of things going on in that chapter. So again, you can move into other counties to get ideas. Um, so there's some other small groups out there for kids who had the Asperger diagnosis before, their parents often went to Aspen for their support. And um, that's a, just a group in every state. Um, let's see, siblings. We actually are running sibling groups here. We realize, okay, I will be honest, siblings have their own risk. Um, so they have a risk for attention deficit disorders, speech and language issues, and anxiety issues. So, so it's just important to consider the needs of siblings. Um, and then siblings as a unique group, sibling of a child with a disability where they fit into the family, their, their sibling needs. There's a, there's a group sometimes that runs for four to seven year olds, but for the most part, you know, it start, everything starts at age seven for siblings. We have a boys group going on right now for um, boy sibs. And then sibling um, support groups, the sib shops is around, you can get it in southern regions, it's up here, and that's um, held in one location on Saturdays, a couple Saturdays a season. Okay, there is this adult autism resource group. So parents who used to be in this Baltimore Chesapeake chapter, whose kids all grew up, so around age 17, you can start to go to their group and get information. Um, because they're really out there getting services that are supposed to be more appropriate for adults with autism, and they've done a good job. They just started a program called Itenerous, and that's, that's become um, a good model for adult resources. Kennedy has lots of specialty programs, so you can see we have a lot going on here at CARD. Um, around Kennedy, oftentimes we use the sleep clinic or the feeding clinic or um, intensive behavioral um, supports. So there's a lot going on here. Um, there's a mental health team, another site. We have some home-based services, but really it's for a child under the age of three, the, the home-based service. Um, and we have um, this 
list I told you about. I promised you I'd give you a good resource. This is a great resource. So if you go, you could call them, you can go online, you can walk in. It's an information and referrals website and we, everybody contributes to it. Um, it's autism specific, has services and providers, and it has a big menu and you can put your zip code in and then they tell you what's located from closest to your house to further away. It's just really a, a, a wealth of information. You know, where do you need to get a haircut for a child who's got a lot of sensory issues to having their head, head touched? Um, something that specific to what are the speech therapies in my area? Okay, speech therapy, by the way, is a high demand resource. Get on more than one waiting list. I can't tell you how long it's going to be, but some of the services you end up waiting a year and you don't want to wait a year. Okay. They have different models, whether it's you know, um, short term or ongoing, and your insurance. So you could spend a lot of money on evaluations and treatment. So be savvy about finding providers that work with your insurance, um, ways to be creative in managing your, your funds. So when you come to Kennedy, this is a, you know, you can take mileage for a medical appointment for your child under your medical expenses. So it's just being mindful of all the ways that you can manage um, your funds. And then family navigators, these are um, in every county and they are um, parents who have a child with disability, not specific to autism necessarily, but they know how to navigate those agencies I told you about, development disabilities, lists, all of those things, or problem areas that you, um, you know, school system, whatever you want to talk to them about. So that's a confidential free service. And then development disabilities, when they send service coordinators to you, you potentially can have help from their service coordination team. It's kind of hard to access that in a consistent way right now. Okay. Whew. Sorry I went over a few minutes. Do you have resource questions?